Welcome to Unwired Learning. In this video, we're going to talk about transistor biasing. Our goals for this video are to explain the purpose for biasing, develop some methods for DC biasing of a transistor, and in developing methods, we're going to create a rules-based approach that gives us a solid starting place for biasing a circuit. Over here on the left, you can see a couple of different circuits, a MOSFET circuit and a BJT circuit. Both of these circuits are what we call four resistor biased. Transistor biasing is often the first step in building a transistor amplifier circuit, as we'll see in future episodes. So the questions are, what and why do we bias a circuit? One of the reasons that we bias a circuit is to put it in a particular operating mode. In the case of a MOSFET, we want to put it in saturation mode for amplification, and for a BJT, the equivalent mode is forward active. One of the main benefits of biasing a circuit is to provide a stable drain or collector current value. Over here in the middle, we find a nearly four resistor biasing circuit, but it's missing the source resistance in this case. In the case of a BJT, it would be the emitter resistor. This particular circuit illustrates why it's important to add that resistor and have a fully biased circuit. Let's consider what the IV curve of this circuit would look like. In this case, we're going to plot the IV curve of ID versus VGS. Because the source is grounded, VGS is the same voltage as VG. And when we plot this IV curve, we get a plot that starts at zero, goes up to the threshold voltage, and then increases by a square, because at that point it will be in saturation mode. This looks all fine, but what happens if this transistor is slightly different from the next transistor we pull out of a bin? Let's say we have two different transistors. One transistor we measure has one threshold voltage, the other transistor has a different threshold voltage. Or it could be that there are process parameter differences. Maybe the thickness of the oxide is slightly different. Maybe the width or the length of the device is slightly different. How do we accommodate for the fact that transistors are not perfect even if they're the same model number? In this example, we'll draw a curve for a second device. And that curve might be slightly different than the curve that we drew for the first device. Now, since VGS is the same as VG, and VG will be a fixed value based on the resistances R1 and R2, what we can do is we can overlay a line at the biasing point of VG. And we'll extrapolate that line up to cross both curves. And what we can see is that when we do that, and we look over to the current value, that the current values are vastly different between device 1 and device 2. In this case, we find that this three resistor biasing circuit is inadequate for providing a constant value of drain current, and thus the need to add the source resistance for a fully biased circuit. The question is, what value do we use for the source resistance and how do we design it? It should be noted that this same problem exists not only with MOSFET circuits, but also with BJT circuits. BJT transistors could vary by their value of beta, in which case we'd get the same result, we'd have two different curves, even if the device is the same model number. So how do we fix this problem? Well, I've already alluded to it. You have to add a source resistance in the case of a MOSFET circuit or an emitter resistor in the case of a, of a BJT circuit. What effect this has, though, is unclear at this point. Let's take a look at this circuit with the source resistance, and let's do some math to understand how the drain resistance is improved by the addition of the source resistor. Let's write an equation for the voltage here at the gate. We can see that the gate voltage will be whatever the value of VGS is, plus the value of the drop across the source resistor. So therefore, we can write the gate voltage as VG equals VGS plus RS times ID. Now all we have to do is solve for the drain current. First, we'll subtract by VGS, then we'll divide by the source resistance. This results in an equation that gives us ID equals VG divided by RS minus VGS divided by RS. Rearranging this equation in slope intercept form for a line, we can get that ID equals minus 1 over RS times the variable VGS plus VG over RS. Since this is an equation for a line, we can draw that line on our graph. The Y intercept for that graph will be the value of VG over RS, and the X intercept, that will be VG. Now, when we look at this, our biasing point is going to be where the curve for the transistor intercepts this line. And we can see that if we extrapolate this to the left, and this value also to the left, that the values of our IDs don't change very much, even though we have two very different devices, thus providing stability in the circuit. This stability is because of the negative feedback that is provided by the addition of the source resistor, as you can see over here in this equation.
For a bipolar junction transistor circuit, we find a very similar result. We can write that IE equals VBB minus VBE divided by the quantity of RE plus RB over beta plus 1. In the case of the BJT, VBE is our variable, and because now we're dividing by this emitter resistor, we find that we have stability in our emitter current because of the addition of the emitter resistor, much in the same way we did for the MOSFET circuit. Now let's take a look at designing a biasing circuit. In this circuit, we're given some parameters that we must obey. First, we're given that VD must be 2.6 volts, and it will have a variance of 1 volt plus or minus. We're also given that we must produce a drain current of about 1 milliamp. Since we know that the voltage at VD is 2.6 volts, we can easily use an Ohm's law equation to find the resistance of the drain. We say that RD equals 5 volts minus 2.6 volts divided by 1 milliamp, which gives us a value of 2.4 kilo ohms. Now, since a biasing circuit is mostly used for amplification, we must recognize that we need to keep the circuit in saturation mode for the entire range of VD, that range being 1.6 to 3.6 volts. To do this, we can recognize the saturation mode inequality of VDS greater than or equal to VGS minus VT. In this case, we're going to expand each side, and we're going to say that VD minus VS equals VG minus VS minus VT. If you're wondering why we use an equal sign, that's because that gives us the edge of saturation, at which point VD will be at its minimum, and we will find a value for the maximum voltage at the gate. As we can see in this equality, we have VS on either side. Therefore, we can cancel VS. That allows us to write that VD equals VG minus VT. Rearranging this, we can set it equal to VG. In this case, remember, it's VG max. So we say VG max equals VD min plus the threshold voltage VT. Since the minimum value of VD is equal to 1.6 volts, we can write 1.6 plus 2, that's the threshold value, is equal to 3.6 volts. With this, we know the maximum allowed value at the gate. Since the circuit we're dealing with is a MOSFET, and we know that there will be no current going into the gate, we don't need to have a whole lot of current over here in these two resistors. Therefore, it's very convenient for us to put the value or the magnitude of these resistances in the mega ohm range. Mathematically, it's also very convenient to make R1 plus R2 equal to whatever the voltage value is here in terms of mega ohms. So in this case, we'll say that R1 plus R2 equals 5 mega ohms. Now that we know that the value of R1 plus R2 is 5 mega ohms, and we know that the value of VG max is 3.6 volts, we can simply recognize that this is a voltage division to find these two values of R1 and R2. In this case, if we need a VG of 3.6 volts, and since the sum is 5 mega ohms, this value of R2 must be 3.6 mega ohms, leaving 1.4 mega ohms for R1. At this point, we're 3 quarters of the way there. All we need to do now is find the value of the source resistance. Before we can do that, we must solve for the value of the voltage that's required at the source. In this case, again, we're going to rely on a saturation mode equation. We're going to use ID equals 1 half KN times VGS minus VT squared. Plugging values in for ID and KN and VG and the threshold voltage, we get that 1 milliamp equals 1 half times 100 times the quantity of 3.6 minus Vs minus 2 quantity squared. Moving the 1 half and 100 from the right over to the left and subtracting 2 from 3.6 leaves us with 0 0.02 equals quantity of 1.6 minus Vs quantity squared. Taking the square root of either side leaves us with 0 0.14 equals 1.6 minus Vs and solving for Vs leaves us with Vs equals 1.46. Since there's one milliamp of current going through the drain and the source resistors, that means that the value of the source resistance must be around 1.46 kilo ohms. Of course, 1.46 kilo ohms is not a common value for a resistor. Therefore, oftentimes we have to adjust our biasing a little bit to find reasonable values for commonly available resistances. In this case, we could move this down to 1.4 kilo ohms.
How do we design the biasing for a transistor circuit when we're not given the information like we were in the previous example? In this case, we can rely on something that we call the one-third rules for biasing. What are these one-third rules for biasing? Great question. Let me show you. First, let me show you for the MOSFET circuit. In this case, we simply want to produce a one-third drop across the drain resistor, the MOSFET, and the source resistor. In the case of the BJT, we also want to produce a one-third drop across the collector. At this point though, there's a couple of other options. We could produce a one-third drop across the transistor, or we could have a one-third voltage at the base. In the case of the MOSFET, we were able to find R1 and R2 by setting the value of R1 plus R2 to be equal to the voltage VDD in terms of mega ohms. However, we must recognize that there is some current that goes through the base. Therefore, we can't set the value of R1 plus R2 equal to VCC in terms of mega ohms. In this case, it's a common rule to say that we want R1 plus R2 to equal the voltage at VCC divided by some fraction of the emitter current. In this case, I've labeled that fraction to be eta, where eta can have a value between 0.1 and 1. For the purposes of efficiency, it's often common that we'll choose the smallest value of eta possible. And there you have it, the one-third rules for biasing. Now let's take a look at how our one-third rules of biasing apply to a BJT example. In this case, we're given that we have a VCC of 9 volts and we desire to have an emitter current of 0.5 milliamps. However, unlike the previous example with the MOSFET, we're not given any desired values for voltages at any of the nodes. So in this case, we're going to apply our one-third rules. We know that we should have a one-third drop across this collector resistor. Therefore, the voltage at the collector should be 6 volts. That makes for a pretty easy calculation for the value of the collector resistor. In this case, we can say that RC equals 9 volts minus 6 volts divided by 0.5 milliamps, and that results in 6 kilo ohms. Using our other one-third rule, we can recognize that we want about 3 volts at the base. In this case, let's set VBB equal to 3 volts. Our last rule is about the values of R1 and R2, so let's apply that rule, and we'll set the value of eta to be equal to 1 tenth, thereby giving us the value that we want through the R1 and R2 resistors to be approximately 0.05 milliamps. Using that information, we can find a total value for the R1 and R2 resistors. We can say that R1 plus R2 equals the 9 volt supply divided by that 0.05 milliamps of current, and that gives us 180 total kilo ohms. Since the R1 and R2 resistors act almost like a voltage divider, we can use that to find the values of R1 and R2. Since the approximate value of the voltage at the base that we want is 3 volts, we can use that to approximate the value of R2. We can say that R2 equals one-third of R1 plus R2, which equals one-third of 180 kilo ohms, and that gives us a value of 60 kilo ohms for R2. Since R1 and R2 total 180 kilo ohms, that leaves us with R1 equaling 120 kilo ohms. At this point, we're almost there in solving this circuit. In order to find an accurate value for the emitter resistor, the best method is to use a loop equation. So to find RE, we can say that 3 volts equals IE over beta plus 1 times RB plus 0.7 plus IERE. Plugging in for values that we already know and solving this equation for RE gives us RE equals 3 volts minus 0.7 volts minus 0.5 divided by 126 times 40 kilo ohms divided by 0.5, and that equals 4.3 kilo ohms. And with that, we've successfully found all of the required resistances for this four-resistor biasing circuit. And that concludes this video of Unwired Learning.